Welcome to Audiobook Heaven. Section 8. Book the Eighth. Argument. Jove assembles the gods, and forbids them to interfere between the Greeks and Trojans. He then repairs to Ida, where, having consulted the scales of destiny, he directs his lightning against the Greeks. Nestor, in the chariot of Diomede, goes against Hector, whose charioteer is slain by Diomede. Jove again interposes his thunders, and the Greeks seek refuge within the rampart. Upon a favorable omen accompanying the prayer of Agamemnon, Diomede and the rest set out, and Teucer performs great exploits, but is disabled by Hector. Juno and Minerva are prevented interfering by Jove, and Hector takes measures to ensure the safety of Troy during the night. Now did saffron-mantled morn diffuse herself over all the earth, and thunder rejoicing Jove made an assembly of the gods on the highest peak of many-topped Olympus, and he himself harangued them, and all the other deities hearkened to his command. Hear me, all ye gods and all ye goddesses, that I may tell you what the soul in my breast prompts me. Let no female deity therefore nor any male attempt to infringe this my injunction, but do ye all at once assent, that I may very speedily bring these matters to their issue. Whomsoever of the gods I shall discover, having gone apart from the rest, wishing to aid either the Trojans or the Greeks, disgracefully smitten shall he return to Olympus, or seizing I will hurl him into gloomy Tartarus, very far hence, where there is a very deep gulf beneath the earth, and iron portals, and a brazen threshold, as far below Hades as heaven is from earth. Then shall he know by how much I am the most powerful of all the gods. But come, ye gods, and try me, that ye may all know. Having suspended a golden chain from heaven, do all ye gods and goddesses suspend yourselves therefrom. Yet would ye not draw down from heaven to earth your supreme counsellor Jove, not even if ye labour ever so much. But whenever I, desiring, should wish to pull it, I could draw it up together, earth and ocean and all. Then, indeed, would I bind the chain around the top of Olympus, and all these should hang aloft. By so much do I surpass both gods and men. Thus he said, but they all became mute in silence, wondering at his speech, for he spoke very menacingly. But at length the azure-eyed goddess Minerva thus spoke in the midst, O sire of ours, son of Saturn, most supreme of kings, well do we all know that thy strength is irresistible. Yet do we truly mourn for the warlike Greeks, who are now perishing, fulfilling their evil fate. But nevertheless we will refrain from war, since thus thou commandest. Yet will we suggest counsel to the Greeks, which will avail them, that they may not all perish because thou art wrathful. But her, the cloud-impelling Jove, smiling, addressed, be of good cheer, Tritonia, my dear daughter. I speak not with a serious intent, but I am willing to be lenient towards thee. Thus having said, under his chariot he yoked his brazen-footed swift-flying steeds, adorned with golden manes. He himself put on gold about his person, and took his golden well-made whip, and ascended the chariot, and lashed them on to proceed, and they, not unwilling, flew midway between the earth and starry heaven. He came to spring-fed Ida, the mother of wild beasts, to Gargarus, where he had a consecrated enclosure and a fragrant altar. There the father of gods and men stopped his steeds, having loosed them from the chariot, and poured a thick haze around. But he sat upon the summits, exulting in glory, looking upon the city of the Trojans and the ships of the Greeks. Meanwhile the long-haired Greeks were taking their repast in a hurried manner through the tents, and after that they put on their armor. But the Trojans on the other side were arming themselves through the city, fewer in number, yet even thus they were eager to fight in battle, compelled by necessity in defense of their children and their wives. And the gates were open wide, and the forces rushed out, both chariot warriors and foot, and much tumult arose. But when these collecting together came into one place, they clashed together shields and spears, and the might of brazen-mailed men, but the bossy shields approached one another, and much tumult arose. There at the same time were both lamentation and boasting of men destroying and destroyed, and the earth flowed with blood. As long as the forenoon lasted, and the sacred day was in progress, so long did the weapons touch both, and the people fell. 
but when the sun had ascended the middle heaven then at length did father jove raise the golden scales and placed in them two destinies of long reposing death the destinies both of the horse-breaking trojans and of the brazen-mailed greeks and holding them in the middle he poised them but the fatal day of the greeks inclined low the destinies of the greeks indeed rested on the bounteous earth but those of the trojans on the contrary were elevated to the wide heaven but he himself mightily thundered from ida and sent his burning lightning against the army of the greeks they having seen it were amazed and pale fear seized them all then neither idomeneus nor agamemnon nor the two ajaces the servants of mars dared to remain gerenian nestor alone the guardian of the greeks remained not willingly but one of his horses was disabled which noble alexander husband of fair-haired helen had pierced with an arrow in the top of the forehead where the forelocks of horses grow out of the head and is most fatal in torture he reared for the arrow had entered the brain and he disordered the other horses writhing round the brazen barb whilst the old man hastening was cutting away the side reins of the horse with his sword then were the swift steeds of hector coming through the crowd bearing the bold charioteer hector and then the old man would certainly have lost his life if diomede brave in the din of battle had not quickly observed it and he shouted dreadfully exhorting ulysses thus jove-born son of laertes much contriving ulysses whither dost thou fly turning thy back in the throng like a coward beware lest some man with a spear transpierce thee in the back flying but stay that we may repel the fierce hero from the aged man thus he spoke but much enduring noble ulysses heard him not but passed by to the hollow ships of the greeks but the son of tydeus though being alone was mixed with the van and stood before the steeds of the aged son of neleus and addressing him spoke winged words o old man certainly the youthful warriors greatly oppress thee but thy strength is relaxed and tiresome old age attends thee thy servant is exhausted and thy steeds are slow but come ascend my chariot that thou mayest see what kind are the steeds of tros skilled to fly and to pursue very rapidly here and there through the plain which lately i took from aeneas authors of flight let the attendants take care of these steeds of thine but let us direct these against the horse-breaking trojans that even hector may know whether my spear also rages madly in my hands thus he said but the gerenian knight nestor disobeyed him not accordingly at once their attendants brave sothenelus and valorous eurymedon took care of nestor's steeds and the two chiefs ascended the chariot of diomede nestor took the shining reins in his hands and lashed the steeds and soon they came near hector at him rushing impetuously forward the son of tydeus launched a spear but the weapon missed him and struck his attendant charioteer in the breast near the pap who was holding the reins of the steeds Eniopius, the son of magnanimous thebaeus but he fell from the chariot and the swift steeds started back and there his soul and his strength were dissolved but excessive grief overshadowed hector in his mind on account of the loss of his charioteer there though grieving for his companion he let him lie and sought a bold charioteer nor did his steeds long want a guide for soon he found courageous archiptolemus the son of iphitus whom then he made to mount the swift-footed steeds and gave the reins into his hands then indeed had slaughter arisen and dreadful deeds had been done and the trojans had been pent up in ilium like lambs had not the father of both men and gods quickly perceived it therefore dreadfully thundering he sent forth his glowing thunderbolt and cast it into the earth before the steeds of diomede but there arose a terrible flame of burning sulphur and the two frightened steeds crouched trembling beneath the chariot moreover the beautiful reins fell from the hands of nestor and he feared in his soul and addressed diomede son of tydeus come now turn thy solid hooved steeds to flight dost thou not perceive that victory from jove does not attend thee for now this very day of a truth saturnian jove awards him glory afterwards again will he give it to us if he shall be willing by no means can a man impede the will of jove not even a very mighty one since he is by far the most powerful but him diomede brave in the din of war then answered old man certainly thou hast said all this rightly but this grievous sorrow invades my heart and my soul for hector at some time will say haranguing amongst the trojans the son of tydeus routed by me fled to his ships 
thus at some time will he boast but then may the earth yawn wide for me but him the gerenian knight nestor then answered alas warlike son of tydeus what hast thou said even though hector called thee coward and unwarlike yet the trojans and dardanians and the wives of the stout-hearted shield-bearing trojans whose vigorous husbands thou hast prostrated in the dust will not believe him thus having said he turned the solid hoof steeds to flight back into the crowd but the trojans and hector with a mighty shout poured destructive missiles upon them and then after him loud roared mighty crest-tossing hector son of tydeus the swift-horsed greeks honoured thee indeed above others with a seat with meat and full cups but now will they dishonour thee for thou hast become like a woman away timorous girl since thou shalt never climb our towers i giving way nor bear away our women in thy ships first shall i give thee thy doom thus he said but the son of tydeus debated whether to turn his steeds and to fight against him thrice indeed he thought in mind and soul but thrice on the other hand the provident jove thundered from the idean mountains giving a signal to the trojans the alternating success of battle but hector exhorted the trojans vociferating aloud ye trojans and lycians and close fighting dardanians be men my friends and be mindful of impetuous might i know the son of saturn hath willingly accorded me victory and great renown but to the greeks destruction fools who indeed built those weak worthless walls which shall not check my strength but our steeds will easily overleap the dug trench but when indeed i come to their hollow ships then let there be some memory of burning fire that i may consume their fleet with the flame and slay the argives themselves at the ships bewildered by the smoke thus having spoken he cheered on his steeds and said xanthus and thou podargus and aethon and noble lampus now repay to me the attention with which in great abundance andromache the daughter of magnanimous aetion gave to you the sweet barley mixing wine also for you to drink whenever your mind ordered it even before me who boast to be her vigorous husband but follow and hasten that we may take the shield of nestor the fame of which has now reached the heaven that it is entirely golden the handles and itself but from the shoulders of the horse-breaking diomede the well-made corselet which the artist vulcan wrought if we can take these i expect that the greeks this very night will ascend their swift ships thus he said boasting but venerable juno was indignant and shook herself on her throne and made great olympus tremble and openly accosted the mighty deity neptune alas far-ruling earth-shaker dost thou not in thy soul pity the perishing greeks but they bring thee many and grateful gifts to helice and aegea do thou therefore will to them the victory for if we were willing and as many of us as are assistants to the greeks to repulse the trojans and restrain far-sounding jove then might he grieve sitting alone there on ida but her king neptune greatly excited thus addressed juno petulant in speech what hast thou said i would not wish indeed that we the other gods should fight with saturnian jove since he is by far most powerful since he is by far most powerful thus indeed were they holding such converse with each other but whatever space before the ships the trench belonging to the tower enclosed was filled with horses and shielded men crowded together but hector the son of priam equal to swift mars had crowded them thus when jupiter awarded him glory and now would he have burned the equal ships with blazing fire had not venerable juno put it through the soul of agamemnon himself actively engaged briskly to urge on the greeks he therefore hastened to go along the tents and ships of the greeks holding in his stout hand his great purple robe but in the huge black ship of ulysses he stood which was in the midst that he might shout audibly to either side as well to the tent of telamonian ajax as to that of achilles for they had drawn up their equal ships at the extremities of the line relying on their valour and the strength of their hands then he shouted distinctly calling upon the greeks shame ye greeks foul subjects of disgrace gallant in form alone where are those boastings gone when we professed ourselves the bravest those which once in lemnus vain braggarts ye did utter eating much flesh of horned oxen and drinking goblets crowned with wine that each would in battle be equivalent to a hundred and even two hundred of the trojans 
but now indeed we are not equal to hector alone who shortly will burn our ships with flaming fire o father jove hast thou indeed ever yet afflicted with such destruction any one of mighty kings and so deprived him of high renown and yet i say that i never passed by thy fair altar in my many benched ships coming here with ill luck but on all i burn the fat of oxen and the thighs desiring to sack well walled troy but o jove accomplish for me this vow at least permit us to escape and get away nor suffer the greeks to be thus subdued by the trojans thus he said and the sire pitied him weeping and granted to him that the army should be safe and not perish and forthwith he sent an eagle the most perfect of birds holding a fawn in his talons the offspring of a swift deer and near the very beauteous altar of jove he cast down the fawn where the greeks were sacrificing to panamphian jove when therefore they saw that the bird had come from jove they rushed the more against the trojans and were mindful of battle then none of the greeks numerous as they were could have boasted that he had driven his swift steeds before diomede and urged them beyond the ditch and fought against the enemy for far the first he slew a helmeted trojan hero agelaus son of phradmon he indeed was turning his horses for the flight but as he was turning diomede fixed his spear in his back between the shoulders and drove it through his breast he fell from his chariot and his arms rattled upon him after him the sons of atreus agamemnon and menelaus after them the ajaces clad in impetuous valor after them idomeneus and meriones the armor-bearer of idomeneus equal to manslaughtering mars and after them eurypolis the illustrious son of evaemon teucer came the ninth stretching his bent bow and stood under the shield of telamonian ajax then ajax indeed kept moving the shield aside and the hero looking around when shooting he had hit any one in the crowd the one falling there lost his life but he retiring like a child to his mother sheltered himself beneath ajax and he covered him with his splendid shield then what trojan first did blameless teucer slay or Silochus first and then ormenus and ophelestes and dator and chromeus and godlike lycophontes and amalpaeon son of polyamon and menelippus all one after the other he stretched upon the bounteous earth but agamemnon king of men rejoiced at seeing him destroying the phalanxes of the trojans with his stout bow and advancing near him he stood and thus addressed him teucer beloved one son of telamon ruler of forces shoot thus if perchance thou mayest become a light unto the greeks and to thy father telamon who brought thee up carefully being a little one and treated thee with care in his palace though being a spurious son him though far away do thou exult with glory but i will declare to thee as it shall be brought to pass if aegis bearing jove and minerva shall grant me to sack the well-built city of ilium next to myself i will place an honourable reward in thy hands either a tripod or two steeds with their chariot or some fair one who may ascend the same couch with thee but him blameless teucer answering addressed most glorious son of atreus why dost thou urge on me hastening nor as far as i have any strength do i loiter but from the time we have driven the trojans toward ilium since that period have i slain men intercepting them with my shafts already have i discharged eight long-bearded arrows and they have all been fixed in the bodies of warlike youths but i cannot strike this raging dog he said and another arrow from the string he shot right against hector for his mind was eager to strike him and him indeed he missed but in the breast he struck blameless gorgithion with an arrow the brave son of priam him his fair mother castianira like unto a goddess in person brought forth being wedded from asima and as a poppy which in the garden is weighed down with fruit and vernal showers droops its head to one side so did his head incline aside depressed by the helmet but teucer discharged another arrow from the string against hector for his mind longed to strike him yet even then he missed for apollo warded off the shaft but he struck in the breast near the pap archiptolemus the bold charioteer of hector rushing to battle and he fell from his chariot and his swift steed sprang back there his soul and strength were dissolved but sad grief darkened the mind of hector on account of his charioteer then indeed he left him although grieved for his companion and ordered his brother cibriones being near to take the reins of the steeds but he was not disobedient having heard him 
Then Hector himself leaped from his all-shining chariot to the ground, roaring dreadfully, and he seized a large stone in his hand, and went straight against Teucer, for his mind encouraged him to strike him. He on his part took out a bitter arrow from his quiver, and applied it to the string, but him on the other hand, near the shoulder, where the collarbone separates the neck and breast, and it is a particularly fatal spot, there, as he was drawing back the bow, the active warrior Hector with a rugged stone struck him earnestly, rushing against him. He broke his bowstring, and his hand was numbed at the wrist joint. Falling on his knees, he stood, and the bow dropped from his hands. But Ajax did not neglect his fallen brother, for running up he protected him, and stretched his shield before him. Afterwards his two dear companions, Mesistheus, son of Achaeus, and noble Elastor, coming up, carried him, groaning heavily, to the hollow ships. But again did Olympian Jove rouse the strength of the Trojans, and they drove back the Greeks straight to the deep fosse. But Hector went in the van, looking grimly through ferocity, as when some dog relying on his swift feet seizes from the rear a wild boar, or lion on the haunch and buttocks, and marks him as he turns. So Hector hung on the rear of the long-haired Greeks, always slaying the hindmost, and they fled. But when they flying had passed through the stakes and the fosse, and many were subdued beneath the hands of the Trojans, they on the other hand remaining at the ships were restrained, and having exhorted one another and raised their hands to all the gods, they prayed each with a loud voice. But on the other hand, Hector, having the eyes of a gorgon, or of manslaughtering Mars, drove round his beauteous maned steeds in all directions. But them the Greeks, white-armed goddess Juno having beheld, pitied them, and thus straightway to Minerva addressed winged words, Alas, daughter of aegis-bearing Jove, shall we no longer be anxious about the perishing Greeks, although in extremity, who now indeed, fulfilling evil fate, are perishing by the violence of one man? For Hector, the son of Priam, rages no longer to be endured, and already has he done many evils. But her the azured-eyed goddess Minerva in turn addressed, And beyond doubt this warrior would have lost his vigor and his life, destroyed by the hands of the Greeks in his fatherland, were it not that this my sire rages with no sound mind, cruel, ever unjust, a counteractor of my efforts. Nor does he remember aught of my services, that I have very often preserved his son when oppressed by the labors of Eurystheus. He truly wept to heaven, but me Jove sent down from heaven to aid him. But had I known this in my prudent mind, when he sent me to the dwelling of the Gaeolar Pluto to drag from Erebus the dog of hateful Pluto, he had not escaped the profound stream of the Stygian wave. But now indeed he hates me, and prefers the wish of Thetis, who kissed his knees and took his beard in her hand, beseeching him to honour city-destroying Achilles. The time will be when he will again call me his dear Minerva. But do thou now harness for us thy solid-hooved steeds, while I, having entered the palace of Aegis-bearing Jove, equip myself with arms for war, that I may see whether crest-tossing Hector, the son of Priam, will rejoice at us, as I appear in the walks of war. Certainly also some one of the Trojans will satiate the dogs and the birds with his fat and flesh, having fallen at the ships of the Greeks. Thus she said, nor did the white-armed goddess Juno disobey her. Juno, on her part, venerable goddess, daughter of mighty Saturn, running in haste, caparisoned the golden-bridled steeds. But Minerva, the daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, let fall upon the pavement of her father her beauteous variegated robe, which she had wrought and laboured with her own hands. But she, having put on the coat of mail and cloud-compelling Jove, was equipped in armour for the tearful war. She mounted her flaming chariot on her feet, and took her heavy, huge, sturdy spear, with which she is wont to subdue the ranks of heroic men, with whomsoever she, sprung from a powerful sire, is enraged. But Juno, with a lash, speedily urged on the steeds. The portals of heaven opened spontaneously, which the hours guarded, to whom are entrusted the great heaven and Olympus, either to open the dense cloud, or to close it. Then through these they guided their goaded steeds. But Father Jove, when he beheld them from Ida, was grievously enraged, and roused golden-winged Iris to bear this message. Away, depart, swift Iris, turn them back, nor suffer them to come against me, for we shall not advantageously engage in battle. For thus I speak, and it shall moreover be accomplished. I will lame their swift steeds under their chariot, dislodge them from the chariot, and break the chariot. 
nor for ten revolving years shall ye be healed of the wounds which the thunderbolt shall inflict that minerva may know when she may be fighting with her sire but with juno i am neither so indignant nor so angry for she is ever accustomed to counteract me in whatever i intend thus he said but iris swift as the storm hastened to bear the message down from the idsean mountains she went to great olympus meeting them in the foremost gates of the many valleyed olympus she restrained them and pronounced to them the message of jove where do ye go where does your soul rage in your breasts the son of saturn does not suffer you to aid the greeks for thus has the son of saturn threatened and he will assuredly perform it to lament your swift steeds under your chariot and dislodge yourselves from the chariot and break the chariot nor for ten revolving years shall ye be healed of the wounds which his thunderbolt shall inflict that thou o azured eyed mayest know when thou art fighting with thy sire but with juno he is neither so indignant nor so angry for she is always accustomed to counteract him in whatever he devises but thou most insolent and audacious hound if thou in reality shalt dare to raise thy mighty spear against jove thus indeed having said swift-footed iris departed then juno addressed these words to minerva alas daughter of ages bearing jove i cannot any longer suffer that we ourselves shall fight against jove on account of mortals of whom let one perish and let another live whoever may chance but let him meditating his own affairs in his mind adjudicate to the trojans and the greeks as is fair thus then having said she turned back to the solid hooved steeds the hours unyoked for them the fair maned steeds and bound them to the ambrosial mangers but they tilted the chariots against the splendid walls but they themselves sat mingled with the other deities on their golden couches sad at heart then father jove drove his beauteous wheeled chariot and steeds from ida to olympus and came to the seat of the gods his horses indeed the illustrious earth-shaker loosed but he laid the chariot on its own support spreading a linen coverlet over it but loud-sounding jove himself sat on his golden throne and mighty olympus was shaken under his feet but minerva and jove by themselves sat apart from jove nor did they at all address him nor question him but he knew in his mind and said why are ye so sad minerva and juno indeed ye have not laboured long in glorious battle to destroy the trojans against whom ye have taken grievous hatred not all the gods in olympus could altogether turn me to flight such are my strength and my invincible hands but trembling seized the shining limbs of both of you before ye saw battle and the destructive deeds of war for so i tell you which would also have been performed no more should ye stricken with my thunder have returned in your chariots to olympus where are the seats of the immortals thus he said but minerva and juno murmured they sat near each other and were devising evils for the trojans minerva indeed was silent nor said anything angry with father jove for wild rage possessed her but juno contained not her wrath in her breast but addressed him most terrible son of saturn what hast thou said well do we know that thy might is invincible yet do we lament the warlike greeks who will now perish fulfilling their evil destiny but nevertheless we will desist from war if thou desirest but we will suggest counsel to the greeks which will avail them that they may not all perish thou being wrathful but her cloud-compelling jove answering addressed to-morrow if thou wilt o venerable large-eyed juno thou shalt behold the very powerful son of saturn even with greater havoc destroying the mighty army of the warlike greeks for warlike hector will not cease from battle before that he arouse the swift-footed son of peleus at the ships on that day when they indeed are fighting at the ships in a very narrow pass for patroclus fallen for thus it is fated but i do not make account of thee enraged not if thou shouldst go to the furthest limits of land and ocean where iapetus and saturn sitting are delighted neither with the splendour of the sun that journeys on high nor with the winds but profound tartarus is all around not even if wandering but thou shouldst go there have i regard for thee enraged since there is nothing more impudent than thou thus he said but white-armed juno answered not and the bright light of the sun fell into the ocean drawing dark night over the fruitful earth the light set to the trojans indeed unwilling but gloomy and much desired light came on grateful to the greeks but illustrious hector then formed a council of the trojans 
having led them apart from the ships at the eddying river in a clear space where the place appeared free from dead bodies but alighting to the ground from their horses they listened to the speech which hector beloved of jove uttered in his hand he held a spear of eleven cubits and before him shone the golden point of the spear and a golden ring surrounded it leaning on this he spoke winged words hear me ye trojans and dardanians and allies i lately thought that having destroyed the ships and all the greeks i should return back to wind-swept ilium but darkness has come on first which has now been the chief means of preserving the greeks and their ships on the shore of the sea but however let us now obey dark night and make ready our repasts and do ye loose from your chariots your beautiful maned steeds and set fodder before them and quickly bring from the city oxen and fat sheep bring sweet wine and bread from your homes and besides collect many faggots that all night till aurora mother of dawn we may kindle many fires and the splendour may ascend to heaven lest haply in the night the long-haired greeks attempt to fly over the broad ridge of the ocean that they may not at all events without toil and without harm ascend their ships but let us take care that each of them may have to heal a wound at home being stricken either with an arrow or with a sharp spear bounding into his ship that every other too may dread to wage tearful war against the horse-breaking trojans let the heralds dear to jove proclaim through the city that the youths at the age of puberty and the hoary templed sages keep watch around the city in the god-built turrets and let the females also the feebler sex in their halls each kindle a mighty fire and let there be some strong guard lest a secret band enter the city the people being absent thus let it be magnanimous trojans as i say and let the speech which is now most salutary be thus spoken but for that which will be most expedient in the morning i will then speak amongst the horse-breaking trojans making vows both to jove and to the other gods i hope to banish hence those dogs born hither by the fates whom the fates bear in their black ships but let us keep watch during the night and in the morning at dawn equipped with arms let us stir up sharp conflict at the hollow ships i will see whether valiant diomede the son of tydeus will force me back from the ships to our walls or whether i shall bear away his bloody spoils having slain him with my brazen spear to-morrow shall he make manifest his valour if he shall withstand my assaulting spear but i think that he will lie wounded amongst the first at sunrise to-morrow and many companions around him would that i were so certainly immortal and free from old age all my days and honoured as minerva and apollo are honoured as i am certain that this day will bring evil upon the greeks thus hector harangued them but the trojans applauded loud and they loosed from the yoke their sweating steeds and bound them with halters each to his own chariot quickly they brought from the city oxen and fat sheep and they brought sweet wine and bread from their homes and also collected many faggots but the winds raised the savour from the plain to heaven but they greatly elated sat all night in the ranks of war and many fires blazed for them as when in heaven the stars appear very conspicuous around the lucid moon when the ether is wont to be without a breeze and all the pointed rocks and lofty summits and groves appear but in heaven the immense ether is disclosed and all the stars are seen and the shepherd rejoices in his soul thus did many fires of the trojans kindling them appear before ilium between the ships and the streams of xanthus a thousand fires blazed in the plain and by each sat fifty men at the light of the blazing fire but their steeds eating white barley and oats standing by the chariots awaited beautiful throned aurora end of book the eighth read by stephen carney